Welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show prepared for you today, and I think you're going to love this technique. It's called Shaped Bias. My doll, Cecil Elizabeth, is wearing a magnificent Shaped Bias dress. It has Shaped Bias linen down the front, and by the way, the dress is on a white Swiss batiste called Nalona. The Shaped Bias down the skirt is stitched down with a Madeira applique or pin stitch, and there is a Madeira applique scalloped panel on the bottom of the skirt. I have a beautiful pillow here, linen, white linen with the robin's egg blue shaped bias done in Celtic lace shaping where one piece goes over, one piece goes under. Absolutely beautiful trimmed and tatting. I also have some really wonderful dresses to share with you which feature the shaped bias. Let me hold this up so you can see the whole dress. The shaped bias is on the collar. It comes down the front. And then this skirt is absolutely magnificent. Let me just hold it open. It's almost one of those skirts that's so fabulous, it needs no description whatsoever. But it has shaped bias, silk ribbon in the middle of the loops, and a machine feather stitch done in blue. That just looks like an Easter egg to me. Shaped bias is not just for children's clothes. It is also magnificent done for women's blouses. This is a very simple blouse without even a set-in sleeve. The shaped bias, once again done in Celtic lace shaping with a perfectly beautiful machine embroidery in the middle of the center of the shaped bias. bias. Very tailored and very elegant. One more dress which is totally beautiful. It's pretty to have shaped bias tone on tone. The shaped bias comes down the wonderful uh, collar on this dress and then it goes all the way down to the skirt, all the way down to the skirt and this is a linen shaped bias on a Nalona or Swiss Batiste dress. Now to learn how to do this very easy technique, won't you come on along with me to the technique boards? Shaped bias is a wonderful technique and it's so easy to work with. All right, to make shaped bias, we're going to need one of these bias tape makers, these little metal gizmos. We're going to cut a piece of bias and you simply run it through it and then come in behind and press. Now, I don't have an iron up here on this board, but that's how you make your shaped bias. I mean, that's how you make your bias, I'm sorry. Now, here we have a piece of shaped bias already ready to go. I have traced off the design I'm going to do, and I, it just bends and twirls so easily, and you press it. Now, we've pinned it here, although I think Sue is going to show you a magical trick that she uses just a little bit of fabric glue and doesn't even have to pin. Anyway, we come all the way around with our shaped bias. And let me show you a little trick. Don't start any, start somewhere that's at a join, at an intersection, because this area right here, I've done my mitering up here, but this little area, when I get to the end point of my shape, I simply tuck that behind, and therefore I have a beautiful finish with no seams anywhere out on the piece. After you get your shaped bias, this is what I call a Celtic cross, Celtic crossing. This piece of bias goes over and then this piece of bias goes under. Now when the bias goes over the other piece, I'm going to stitch all along, a, a continuous line. When the bias comes underneath, I'm going to stop stitching, jump over to the other side to begin stitching again. And that's where you get that wonderful Celtic look. I have invited my very dear friend, Sue Pennington, who also invented this technique, to come to be with us today. Sue, thank you so much for coming to the show and, and we're just welcome back. <laughs> thank you for inviting me, Martha. The first step in, uh, in this technique is to cut strips of fabric. I like to use handkerchief linen for my bias strips because it has a nice stretchy bias. And uh, the strips are a little more than twice the width of the finished bias uh, that you're going to make. I have, I'm making half inch bias and so I cut my strips a little bit wider than one inch. Thread the, the fabric strip through the bias tape maker. And there's a little slit on the bottom that you can use to help push the fabric through. And get it, get it started, put a little bit out. Then press the fabric as it comes out of the bias tape maker. And you have a nice sharp fabric 
You're pressing on the top. I'm pressing on the top, yes. Okay. And it, the, the turned under edges are on the bottom. The next step is to take this fabric strip then, cut off one of the ends, and I've traced my pattern on the, on the base fabric. I use water-soluble fabric glue instead of pins to hold the fabric, to hold the strip in place. I'll start at one of the intersections and just very lightly put a little squiggle of glue along the, um, the marked line. Then I'll take my pressed bias strip and center it over the line and shape a few inches in place and press it with an iron just to dry the glue. Continue with your, with your bias strip, which is pressed all the way around. Miter it at the corner just as you would miter lace insertion and finish it as Martha showed you on the, on the um, board. This piece has been glued down all the way around. Here's the little end, which I will tuck underneath, and then I'm ready to stitch. I usually don't need to use a stabilizer because by this point I have glue and quite a lot of starch on here. I will use a pin stitch, a length of two, and a width of two. I'll start at the intersection, back stitch one or two stitches, I am using a 100 or 110 universal needle. Not a, not a wing. I don't, I don't like to use wing needles for this. I seldom use wing needles. I usually like the look of a universal needle better. I'm stitching so that the forward and backward portion of the stitch falls in the base fabric only and the side to side teeth of the stitch fall into the bias and hold it in place. That's the same way I would stitch Madeira applique. This technique is a wonderful counterpoint for Madeira applique. They go very well together because you can use the same fabric and the same stitch. And on a lot of my samples, you see that I've done that. After I've stitched this piece all the way around on this edge of the, of the bias, then I'll stitch on the other side. And that's all there is to it. And I'll show you the finished sample. This is the uh, finished piece. After the stitching is done, the uh, piece needs to be soaked in warm water to get rid of all the glue and the markings, and then press dry. And that's all there is to it. It's a lovely well, technique. Sir, it is a lovely technique, and I'll have to be honest with you. I did not know when you pull the bias through that you press the wrong, press the back. See, I've always it's, tried to press. That, uh, that was a wonderful trick for me to learn. <laughs> a, a lot of my students have been real impressed with just the tip on using the just bias the tape maker. Just the tip on <laughs> using the bias tape maker. Sue, thank you so much thank for you, being Martha. here. I just love this technique. It's so exciting. And you know what? I now happen to know that you've used this technique for a beautiful outfit for our sewing for baby section. This Godet christening dress is so magnificent. It has this absolutely wonderful full skirt and it really makes a full circle when the baby sits down. Sue has taken the uh, curved bias technique. It's, it's a little bit found, a little bit on the top with a little hand embroidery. But each one of the Godets has this beautiful strip of the curved handkerchief linen. And this dress has hand embroidery inside of each one of these little pieces. And then the machine feather stitch that goes around the edge. All kinds of wonderful treatment and an absolutely magnificent dress. Sue, you're just more more magnificent and more magnificent. What are you going to share with us about this baby dress today? Well, thank you, Martha, but I'm going <laughs> to share another technique with the, uh, with the christening gown that is uh, useful for just about everything that you do, and that is a continuous lap placket. Um, most dresses need this at the back waist or the back yoke, and it's also something that uh, ladies' blouses need at the cuff, and uh, you'll use it in, in a lot of different things. The first thing that you'll need to do is uh, get your piece of fabric, if it's a skirt, find the center back and cut a slit as long as you want your placket to be. If your fabric is kind of loosely woven or you feel uncomfortable just cutting a slit, you can first stitch a long narrow V right down that center fold line as long as you want your placket. 
The V will be about half an inch wide at the top, tapering down to a point at the bottom, stitch one stitch straight across, and then stitch back up. And then you would cut down the center of that V right to the very point. And this kind of also gives you a stitching line, and it's also necessary for loosely woven fabrics. You'll also need a strip for the placket, a straight grain strip for the placket, about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half wide. Now I'm going to place this so that the raw edges are even at the top edge of the fabric, but at the bottom of the slit, it will be about a quarter of an inch from the raw edge of the fabric. See how this angles in like that? And I'm going to stitch an even quarter of an inch with a shortened straight stitch, about 1.5 stri stitch length, a quarter of an inch seam allowance so that my stitching will follow along here and it'll always be a quarter of an inch from, this, from the edge of the placket piece but it will just catch a few straight stitches at the bottom of the V. I put my placket piece on the wrong side of the skirt fabric. I'm going to stitch this. At the bottom of the V catch just a couple of stitch, a couple of threads in the fabric and then I find it easier to reposition my fabric and open up the V just a couple of um, steps at a time. Then position it so that the raw edges are even at the top and continue stitching the length of your placket. The next step then is to press the seam allowance toward the placket and then press under a quarter of an inch on the raw edge of the placket. Then I'm going to fold this over. Now this is the right side of your garment. I'll fold over that folded edge so that it just covers the stitching line. And I'll again stitch this by machine. I stitch by machine whenever I can, Martha. I don't blame you. <laughs> and I'm going to stitch very close to this. As long as I just cover my stitching, um, the, the previous stitching will be, will be hidden. How wide did you say the original straight piece for your placket was? Uh, I use an inch and a half for most things. Sometimes for baby garments I'll use an inch and a quarter so uh -huh. that the placket's a little bit narrower. I stitch that. And then I'd also press that. The next step then is to flip this to the wrong side of the garment we're going to make a little tuck in the, in the placket so that it's, it doesn't flip out. So this is the wrong side of the garment, and now I'm going to stitch a little triangle right along this edge. I'll back stitch, stitch forward to, right to the point, and back stitch again a few stitches. And now my placket is complete. And it's very strong, it's very neat, and uh, it's very practical. You know what, Sue, those continuous lap plackets are so necessary in mm -hmm. classic children's clothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a magical trick. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here, Sue. We Thanks loved lot, having you on the show. Our industry, the wonderful sewing industry, has so many new notions that are being developed on a yearly basis. I love seeing what's going to come up next. And here we're going to show you some, some a very new notion, which was demonstrated recently at a consumer show in Arlington, Texas. Here is a clever notion. Well, up until the computer technology, you had to go to a pattern bookstore and buy a pattern. And it's always a question what size to get. The best fitting pattern is the size you were the day you stopped growing, which means your shoulder and neck area. The problem is your bust, waist, and hips are other sizes. So today with a computerized pattern, it takes your intimate body measurements and uses a computer system to move the pattern parts around so that you can get the pattern in the mail, just lay it down on the cloth, cut, sew, and wear. And your body can change, the computer can track if your body gets larger or smaller. And so the fun part of sewing is the sewing part. The not so much fun part is the fitting part, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. A traditional pattern is um, balanced. It has a certain circumference in the bust, the waist, and the hips, and it assumes your body is all one size. When in reality, we might be a 10 in the front, a 12 in the back, and a 16 in the hips. So if the computer does that fitting process for you, 
you don't have to get involved and it makes sewing a lot more fun and successful. This wrap pillow is fabulous. It's velveteen on the top with uh, a taffeta underneath and wonderful machine embroidery. You are going to love the way this pillow is made. Let's open up the whole thing. There's a strip over here with no stuffing, a strip over here with no stuffing. That's what makes the wrap. And let me just share with you how it is made. Okay, this is a little miniature pillow here. I ha the pillow is this shape. I come in here with my braid. And when I come around the corners, I'm gonna have to clip the corners, but I'm gonna sew the braid. Of course, I'm gonna clip the corners as I come around here, get all the braid on. This is my velveteen. I'm gonna sew it face down. And I'm going to sew all the way around, except I do have to leave a space over here. Now, after I sew it all the way around, I'm gonna sew across here and across here. I think I have one almost finished to show you. All right, after I've sewn the whole pillow, the velvet on the bottom and the taffeta on the inside, I'm going to sew along here, sew along here, but I have left an opening right here. After I sew it, then I'm going to stuff this with pillow, fill, and then I'm going to bring this over and bring this over. And of course, if I want to do machine embroidery, this is where I did it on the pillow. Isn't that an interesting and a fabulous pillow? It's also very easy and you know I like that. Next, I have a hand embroidery section to share with you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today my very dear friend, Kathy Neal. Kathy is one of the world's authorities on hand embroidery, and I am just delighted, Kathy, that you have come again to share on our show. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Martha, for asking me. Today, I would like to talk to you about making handmade eyelets. Eyelets are a beautiful, beautiful embroidery stitch, and Today I brought an example, an antique example, and this is a little matinee jacket coming from the French matin, meaning morning. So for the chilly mornings, this is a little antique matinee jacket for a baby. And you'll see it has many of the little holes on here. And um, these are little eyelets. Now this technique is called broderie anglaise. And broderie anglaise just means embellishment with eyelets. And I'd like to show you how to make those eyelets. There are three steps to making successful eyelets. First of all, I think it's very important to trace your eyelet exactly the size that you want it. The next step is to outline that eyelet. And I'd like to show you how I do that. First of all, I need to tell you that there are two types of running stitches. I'm going to make the first one here that many of you are familiar with where the needle simply goes in and out of the fabric. And if you'll look right here on the line, you'll see that not much of the line is covered up with just a plain running stitch. But let me tell you about another outlining stitch and that is an uneven running stitch. And that is where you pick up only a thread or two maybe just one thread with each stitch. And if you'll look at the difference, you will see that with the uneven running stitch where you only pick up a thread or two, there's much more even coverage on the, um, on the outlining. Now, we want to use this uneven running stitch. And I'll go right up here to this eyelet that we're going to make. And what we want to do is we want to go all the way around our drawn line picking up just one of these threads. And when we do that, we get a nice cushion around the edge of this eyelet that'll make the eyelet have some dimension. And after we've picked up one of those, then we go back and split the first stitch. That's just to anchor it. And we come right back up on the edge of the eyelet. Now, we want to take a stiletto or an awl. This is a nice antique ivory awl. Um, you can also find them in wood. And um, there are also metal ones in your commercial sewing stores. Sometimes you'll find it's called a stiletto, sometimes an awl. But you want to take your awl and gently 
rotate it. We don't want to stab the fabric uh, for fear that we might break the actual fibers in the fabric. But if we gradually twist, and that leaves a nice hole, and what we want to do is just simply go around the hole with an overcast stitch. Now, you'll notice that as we go around this, we will we will begin to see the hole, the fibers close up in the hole. And in order to maintain the nice hole, we want to keep our stiletto close by and keep resizing the hole as we go. We want to stitch all the way around this hole so that there's a nice edge. Now I brought our back our little wool felt baby shoes that we're working on on these shows, and you'll see that I have three of the eyelets here. The wool felt, you don't really need um, an, an awl for your felt, but instead we have our special awl, and that <laughs> is our favorite hole punchers. And I brought one shoe to show you that after you mark your little place where you want your eyelet, you can just take this 1 8 inch hole puncher, punch out the hole, and then I take a little pair of tweezers and go up in here and pull the little um, um, felt out from behind the hole, and then I'm ready to work the eyelet in just the same manner that I did it on the embroidery hoop. And as you see, it makes a lovely finish for these little baby shoes. Oh, Kathy, that is so fascinating and so beautiful, and I'm so glad that many, many people are interested in doing hand embroidery. Yes. It seems like there's a real resurgence of interest. I think so, too. Kathy, thank you so much. And now, won't you join me in my attic? I purchased this dress on a very rainy, cold Saturday morning at Portobello Road in London. It has some perfectly wonderful embroidery on it. It has the raised satin stitch and these little bows and the little bow with a little circle, or rather a little over below it. These are done out of drawn thread fil ray and there is a bird's eye filling in, along with the fil ray The hand embroidery goes all the way around the little waistband and then the bottom of this dress has more beautiful hand embroidery with the filter ray inside the little bows and a beautiful uh, buttonhole stitch on the bottom. As you always know, the backs of these dresses of the turn of the century dresses had embroidery and details absolutely beautiful just like the fronts of the dresses. For my Sewing from the Heart today, I have a letter from Bonnie Allison from Lakewood, Colorado. My friends and I made 19 quilts to send to Kosovo. Watching the old women trying to walk or ride in carts to escape the horrors of war was too much for me, probably because I'm getting old myself. I found a fabric shop that gave me a good price on fabric. My friends each brought a quilt bat. We talked and laughed and put our hearts into the quilts. One was especially striking. Brilliant blue and red strips of fabric joined to make varying stripes across the quilt. Imagine our surprise and pleasure when we spotted an old woman in the television coverage of Kosovo wrapped in that wonderful red and blue quilt. Truly a message that said our labors were rewarded and the quilts were being used to give the comfort intended. The group of ladies that I worked with was not an organized group as such, only women wanting to help women as only women can do. Bonnie Allison from Lakewood, Colorado. Bonnie, I am so thrilled to receive this letter. I was so pleased that you wanted to share this wonderful project of love to make the quilts to send to Kosovo. And what a thrill it must have been for you and your friends to see on the television the old woman wrapped in that beautiful quilt that you made. Bonnie, thank you for your efforts and for those of your friends. I want to thank all of you for coming to my sewing room today. I've had a wonderful time, and we certainly hope you have. Most especially, I would like to invite you back next time. Music